uh, you cannot probably take the chip off, image it, and do something with it. It is written in a special format that is completely uh, unknown at the moment. I'm still dealing with trying to get some information on how it's written. Because my thought process is, is that if you have a block, and the block has to go through a cycle for an erase, if you're doing forensics and there's two files that are on there, you may have thought that you already deleted and wiped a particular block and your file is gone. But in forensics, the file is probably still there. Just like it is on a hard drive when you do a delete, the only difference is that you can't really do a wipe cycle or you can't really do an erase cycle like you can with a hard drive and still go back and get the data you know, from a standpoint on the flash drive. So it would be nice to know if we can actually take a chip off, copy the chip, and then get the content out of the chip that you thought was already erased. So you can see with the benefit there. So you pretty much need to kill your flash drive with a hammer is probably a good idea. Uh, don't sell it on eBay or whatever else because at some point in time I think somebody's going to actually figure out how to decrypt these chips and actually be able to recover files you thought were long gone. So. <clears throat> Is this a homicide case? <laughs> You know, I've had quite a few. This is a really cool thing about not only doing forensic but data recoveries is you get the whole story. People does, they don't just send you a hard drive and say, you know, please fix it. They send you their life story and a book and please, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. It, you know, it gives us a lot of insight into what kind of content we're going to find on the drive or whatever when we recover it. Uh, you know, naked pictures of my wife. And we try harder to recover those hard drives. So... <laughs> It really does help sometimes, uh, you know, get us into the job. But uh, there's quite a few. There's a couple other stories that are coming up in the same kind of thing. But I do get a lot of these where the, the guy is typing an IM to his girlfriend while his other girlfriend is right behind him. And that causes the laptop to be thrown out of a window and into a pool. Um, it happens often. <clears throat> One of the hardest things for us to deal with is this clicking noise. Anybody ever had this hard drive that has this clicking? Yeah, everybody. You know, they say that only like 3% of hard drives are failing. Yeah. It, it, that, that was more than 3% in this room, I think. But um, the whole point is that dealing with this clicking noise is one of the most difficult things that you can do in a data recovery. And I just wanted to explain and go through the process of what happens at this point in time, and then some things that you can do to fix it. And some of the things that can fix it also fix other problems, like firmware problems and things along the way. So I'm going to kind of break that down and go through some of the components. But I need to teach you a little bit about what I'm going to be talking about and what those areas are. Right now, I'm going to be dealing with this area in this talk that's over here where the actuator arm is that goes all the way back underneath here in the IC board. Uh, in previous talks, I've talked about the spindle and the platters and how to deal with some of those items. And if you go on the internet, you'll be able to see there's plenty of other talks. And all the Torcon talks from last year were posted already online. Uh, I think Hikari already put them on Google Video or something. So when you go through a power on routine, you first power up your hard drive. Basically, the very first thing it's going to do is it's going to try to check and see if all the electronics are in good shape. So it's running through a process, and it's very quick. It's almost instantaneous. It does a self-check and makes sure all of its components there. And there's one particular component that has to pass through, which is called preamp. I'm going to get to that in a few minutes. After the self-check runs, and it says, OK, fine, I'm OK, then it starts to do the spindle spin up. Now, this particular piece that's blinking over here on the right, the red, that is basically a locking mechanism. This is one of the pieces that is gradually changing in all the hard drives. and it is almost gone. As of the middle of last year, it was the normal thing you would see in every drive. It is basically a little tiny piece of plastic that teeters based on airflow. When the spindle starts to spin up and the hard drive starts to spin, it creates airflow. And as soon as the amount of airflow is significant enough, it will teeter this piece of plastic out of the way. And at the other end of this piece of plastic is the locking mechanism that keeps the head arm from moving. Most of the ones now that have like the instant I'm going to power off your hard drive because we have an accelerometer in your laptop and we saw that you dropped it and we want to turn off the power in your laptop in ho hopes that you save that drive. Um, how many people have one of those in their laptop? How many people have had one of those fail? Like you dropped your laptop and you still couldn't do a data recovery from it. 
Um, it happens. I've seen them. So they're still out there. They're still a problem. Uh, it doesn't power them off fast enough. It has to have a fairly decent size fall in order to turn it off so that it can park the head fast enough. But some of the parking mechanisms now are becoming electronic. They're actually still simplistic and based on magnetic force. But when power is applied in a certain place, it basically jerks the arm back and then locks the pin. So this is changing a little bit. It really doesn't affect data recovery from that standpoint. You still do exactly the same thing as far as that goes. There is another change coming up that does affect data recovery. Um, after it does that and that teeters out of the way, the heads will then have enough airflow to cause them to float over the platters. So this is the part that's getting a little touchier now. Uh, basically, it had a pretty good distance before that before like 2001 that the head would not actually hit the platter under small conditions of, of being whacked. But because our heads are more sensitive now, they move them closer to the platter. So now we have a bigger problem again where if you whack the hard drive, it actually you know, hits the platter itself. And how many people have one of these uh, like free agent hard drives? Anybody bought a Seagate free agent? No? Have you noticed that most of the hard drives that they have now, they stand upright? It's like a design decision for external hard drives where they have a, they're standing upright physically. I get an email almost every day from maybe at least two or three people where that hard drive that was standing up, that somebody bumped the table and it fell over. And then the head whacked the platter. Now, I think it's a pretty bad idea to have your, your hard drive standing straight up unless you have it in a really secure place where you're not going to knock it over. So just keep that in mind and be very cautious because it's a common thing that happens. And people tend to put them like on the edge of a desk and then they flip <laughs> over and it's gone pretty much uh, at that point. So uh, there's a lot of work to rebuild those and they're pretty hard to do. So after it does that and the head finally has come out of its park position, it basically goes through the servo timing, the reading. It's, uh, the head itself is actually reading content off the platter about what its timing is, and it kind of syncs up with firmware at that point in time to try to resolve my geography, where things are going to be, where the head's going to actually sit. And then, depending upon the type of hard drive that you're dealing with, you have what's called the SA area. The SA area on a three and a half inch hard drive, and I'm going to get into the SA area and kind of explain what everything is here in a second. On a three and a half inch hard drive, the SA area is typically on the outside edges of a platter. On a two and a half inch hard drive, a laptop hard drive, it is typically on the inside rings of the platters. So that just knowing where that geography is and where those things are can make a difference if you're opening up a drive and you look at it and you see a scratch in a particular place, it can start to make sense to you why you're having this particular problem. So I'm going to go into that and kind of break that down. <clears throat> I got that hard drive too. Uh, I was actually able to fix that hard drive because I went through the logic board, not through the platters. Um, okay, so the system area. What is the system area? Basically, most people know that you have some calibration area or you've had these uh, negative cylinders or maintenance tracks. Most people still have called them negative cylinders or reserved area. Basically, the th content that's in there is things like your smart logs, your system logs, your serial numbers. Uh, the hard drive in older hard drives, the serial number usually came from the PCB board, the, the circuit board on the drive. Nowadays, typically, it is in the SA area on the hard drive for probably the last four or five years in most hard drives. It is physically written into an area, into a platter area that you don't normally see where your data is. Uh, and when you boot up, it'll read that content, and then that's how you actually get the serial number in your BIOS when you're booting your hard drive and looking at it. If the SA area is messed up, you typically will not get your serial number at that point in time. So you kind of have to know which hard drive it is you're dealing with. So if you see the serial number, yeah, I'm lucky enough I'm able to actually get the content. If not, then you at least know where you probably have a problem. And then the P list and the G list, I'm going to go into those two components. Those are typically your bad block tables. The rest of the stuff is based on firmware and things that can be loaded onto the hard drive, like extra test routines and things that the manufacturer, an individual manufacturer made that they might want to test a particular hard drive for. And then again, your passwords. Some of your passwords are there as well. So if you have something that can delete part of an SA area and it knows where the password is, that's how you can get access to your drive again if you and some of those are also done through jumpers or through pins on the bottom. <clears throat> All right, so I want to describe to you how the, this is done. This is, this is 
how items in the essay area are stored. Basically, it's groups of these sectors that are together. Typically, you would say, I've got, you know,